So uh, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for being on time. So we're starting with the second session, uh, which will deal with some um, approaches to managing high amounts of measurements data. The first talk will be by my colleague and uh, usual office mate, uh, Alex Geil, uh, who will talk about uh, NetFlow. Uh, so arguably, NetFlow IPFix is the oldest form of streaming telemetry. And we've been using it. It was invented in 96, I just checked, so 24 years ago. And Alex will show you how to use modern data plane technologies to keep it running at scale. So take it away, Alex. Right. So uh, as I already mentioned, so this will be a talk about good old NetFlow, but uh, still maintaining the unsampled uh, NetFlow paradigm. So NetFlow clearly is, is one of the oldest uh, network telemetry um, sources around. And it's still relevant today. And I expect it to remain relevant also for the coming years. So um, uh, originally, my, in, the, in its simplest form, um, we keep track of like source destination addresses and ports, um, IP protocol, and usually also the interface so that we know from which basically BGP speaker we, we receive or pack it or send, send it to. Um, it went through a whole, the usual process from a proprietary solution to an, an ITF standard in the form of IPFIX. Um, and it comes in two variants these days. So unsampled, which simply means that you account for every single packet and you um, assign every single packet that you're about to receive or send uh, to a flow. And uh, on the other hand, uh, sampled, um, that refers to um, the practice of just looking at one in every n packets and therefore of course you lose granularity and you have to do some sort of statistics to interpret the results and as far as i understand most uh, isps well first of all most isps do use uh, netflow these days probably all of them in some form or another um, but uh, it is very common today to use sampled netflow and usually um, ap apart from the large volume of data that, that it produces it's, it's also the capability of actually um, accounting for every single packet, which is hard to do um, in traditional routers. So um, why are we even interested in unsampled NetFlow? Um, clearly for a lot of types of analysis, this is not needed for any, obviously for any kind of analysis that um, um, makes, wants to make statements about um, aggregates of traffic, clearly sampling is, is perfectly all right. But there are situations when it's very nice to have um, unsampled net flow. So for example, in, in, for the analysis of, of security incidents, when you want to maybe track signal break-ins or low volume communications between um, um, uh, a CST server and, and, and botnet clients and so forth, um, also for network debugging, occasionally we are very happy that we can look at like single packets, uh, see if, uh, if a TCP SYN packet gets through or where it's sent to or whether the handshake completes or things like that or <coughs> DNS transactions. And also if we can do it and if, if the price is low enough for us to be able to do it, why not? I mean, we will find applications for it later on. So uh, at Switch, we've been using Cisco, um, sorry, uh, NetFlow for, for a long time. Actually, I think, and that was also a reason why Simon, I think, started originally his work at, at Switch to, he, he wrote an, an analysis software for NetFlow. So we've been using this for a long time. Um, and for many years, our, um, uh, all the equipment that we used um, was able to generate NetFlow in one form or another. And um, we were able to do that in an unsampled fashion when we were still using the old Catalyst 6500, 7600 uh, routers, which we still have a few around. But then when we moved to another platform, in this case, it was the SR9000, um, uh, that from the start was only capable of producing sampled NetFlow. So we wanted to keep uh, unsampled NetFlow. And so about five years ago, we switched to um, a system that used uh, external, uh, uh, an appliance that used um, hardware acceleration uh, to produce unsampled NetFlow. That was, um, th those were devices from, uh, from Flowmon. And we used them until recently, and now we just started to replace those with um, in-house developed uh, systems 
to um, keep the keep the price down and uh, add interesting features. So um, we are a small network, um, and just to give you a, a feeling of how large our network is, so here are a few uh, numbers, um, and they always uh, include both inbound and outbound traffic. And on, we only consider traffic with our external peers, so not no, we don't collect NetFlow data inside our AS, just on the border to other ASs. So uh, the peak values are uh, in the traffic volume are around 100 gigabits per second, 15 million packets per second, and up to 250,000 uh, uh, flows per second. The average values, which are relevant for the collection of NetFlow data, is roughly around 150,000 flows per second. And with the template that we use, this translates to roughly about a terabyte per day. And on our current analysis system, we have between 20 and 30 terabytes. So this gives us space for uh, storing flows for three or maybe four weeks. And uh, the analysis, this is the actual big data problem. And we, uh, we, we are still looking at a solution for that part of the problem uh, where we can still have analysis on a per flow granularity, but this is not the subject of my talk here. So as we heard from a previous talk, um, there, um, we actually use um, a, a solution that adds additional hardware to our POP, but it's, it's not much and it's, uh, it's fairly cheap and not too hard to manage. So basically per POP, the architecture involves three components. So um, we use optical taps on our uh, external interfaces to create copies of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of all the, the traffic. And um, uh, so this also has the, uh, advantage to having um, uh, the processing out of the data path. Then we use what we call a packet broker, um, which uh, the main purpose of that is to um, aggregate the traffic from all of these interfaces uh, to a small set of interfaces, currently 200 gig uh, ports um, that uh, uh, connects the broker to the actual uh, uh, generator of, of NetFlow. Um, so in a, in a picture that uh, basically how it looks like, so we have our border router and a, a splitter and um, the, clearly for, e for every link that we monitor, we require two ports on the packet broker for one port for each direction. And then we then <coughs> aggregate all of this traffic. Um, we clearly lose information on which port we have received or sent a packet. We are interested, we want to know um, on which original port on the router the packet was sent or received. So we add VLAN tags so that the exporter can then interpret these VLAN tags and reconstruct the uh, interface index uh, that um, uh, from, from the router perspective. So uh, the packet broker, uh, we used to use an open flow based system um, to, to do that, but it uh, was a bit awkward to uh, to use the programming and also the flexibility was lacking a little bit. And so recently we uh, switched to a P4 programmable device. Um, so in, in our case, we use the, um, the wedge uh, device from Edge Core, which has a 32 um, QSFP uh, ports that can run up to hundred gigabits uh, per second. And they use the Tofino NPU. So the, those devices are pretty handy, small, they're cheap, uh, this particular one costs about 6,000 euros. And so I developed the P4 program for that packet broker functionality myself, which is a pretty small program. You can, if you're interested, you can see the source code at the link. Um, unfortunately, if you want to use it, you first have to sign an NDA with Barefoot or Intel now these days. Um, so that will enable you to download the NDA, uh, sorry, the, the, the source development environment, and then you will be able to compile this program. So um, that was uh, a pleasant experience to use P4 to do that. And it also allows us to add additional functionality that it's not related to NetFlow. For example, I've added code that allows us to mirror packets uh, for particular flows. So, so we can anal analyze it um, to a TCP dump and things like that. So that is a, a nice benefit from uh, from this technology. Now the exporter itself is uh, another, uh, just in our case, a uh, one rack unit x86 based server. Um, 
currently uh, we've decided to use an AMD um, a CPU um, because it's beneficial to have uh, many cores at uh, preferably high um, clock rate. And uh, so this particular CPU uh, is, is, um, uh, has 16 cores and uh, um, it runs up to 3.3 gigahertz and uh, it's, it's still fairly cheap. And it also has PCI4 um, uh, support. Then we use the Mellanox uh, Connect X5 based um, dual port 100 gig card. Um, and this entire device, including uh, uh, the NIC, costs around 4,000 euros. Uh, for the uh, the software itself, um, we also um, we went from this um, appliance to our own uh, software that I've developed in um, in the framework of uh, the uh, the snap switch. Um, some of you may have heard of that, so I've put I've put a link uh, to the GitHub repository, and um, there's also a link to to the um, IPFIX related code if you're interested in. So. This is an interesting framework. So it runs in user space. And the special thing is that it uses a high level language, in this case, uh, Lua. And um, it uh, actually um, removes the entire device from the Linux kernel and it implements its own device driver. It's also written in Lua. And the key to making it fast is to use a very, very uh, efficient uh, JIT compiler. So the entire, the, the actual system that I'm using is called Lua JIT. And that's a really an, an amazing piece of, of engineering. And it allows you to use a high level language and still have a very, uh, very fast code. Then <clears throat> um, all flow-based processing is, uh, is, very, is fairly easy to, to scale because uh, you just have to perform the hash over the, the, the flow signature and then you can distribute the load easily uh to different cores and i use a combination of hardware and software rss for certain reasons uh, the, i've implemented features that also require me to do certain things in uh in a software rss uh technique but uh, in the end it's uh it, it scales very well with the number um uh, of cores on the system so with all the features that i've implemented currently it's it's kind of hard to give you a number about this, but it's just a, like a ballpark figure. It's probably around 1500 cycles per packet. But this includes, for example, making longest prefix matches for the source and destination addresses to find out the source and destination AS, for example, that's also done within this uh, cycle budget. Um, we, we also resolve the um, previous and next adjacent AS uh, that we use MAC addresses and uh, mappings to IP addresses of peers. So we can, for example, on exchange points where we have multiple ASs, we can uh, say exactly from where we receive a packet or where we send it to based on the MAC address. Um, I've also in, uh, implemented a couple of um, specialized templates, for example, for DNS or HTTP inspection. And we actually can copy, create copies of packets and process them on a separate core. So we don't um, slow down um, the, uh, the the regular NetFlow uh, generation with uh, uh, like stuff that requires a lot of processing power. So uh, as a conclusion, we found that with uh, about two rack units of space and about 10,000 euros per pop, uh, we can uh, have an infrastructure that uh, serves our purpose to create unsampled NetFlow for our network. And it's, uh, it, it has a lot of room to scale still. And I, I would, I estimate that with this setup, we could scale up to 25 million packets per sec second um, when we use all 16 cores. We could also add another NIC to have four um, hundred gig links to the packet broker. And this should enable us to uh, keep producing um, ensemble NetFlow for the, the size of a network of, comparable to switch for yeah, probably a couple of years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, and uh, thanks for uh, keeping the time. I suggest that we keep to the convention of having the questions and answers at the end of the session. So if uh, Marinos uh, could make his slides ready. So the next talk will be about DDoS detection on P4 SmartNICs, so similar to Damien's talk before the break, uh, and it will be done by Marinos Dimoljanes from NTU Athens. 
Hi, hello everyone. I hope you can see me and you can hear me. Yes, very well. So uh, I'm going to present an effort related to DDoS detection on P4 SmartNICs. This is a joint effort with my colleague Adam Pavlidis, who is my advisor, Professor Vasily Magaris. As you already know, DDoS attacks are a widespread problem for network operators. They they are still a complex thing to identify and detect, and they are actually needed to be identified and detected really, really fast. So legacy detection mechanisms such as flow, net flow, or even open flow require to extract data from the network, relay them to an external controller, collector, sorry, and which in turn analyze them and come to a conclusion related to the existence of an attack. In contrast, in this work, we propose an in-network DDoS detection scheme in which we identify network anomalies or network attacks in the data plane as packet traverses the pipeline of the switch. And if we come to a conclusion related to the existence of an attack, then we push a notification to an external mitigation system, which is tasked with containing the, the anomaly. So we consider to use some traffic features that are insightful matrix related to the existence of an attack in a network. And these are the total number of unique flows, the subnet significance, this is the flows per destination network, and the packet symmetry, again, for our destination networks. So all these three metrics are calculated within specific time windows, short time windows, in order to actually compare those values with appropriately defined thresholds. And if those values exceed our thresholds, then we consider that we have an ongoing anomaly. These traffic features can be used uh, also in different combinations, depending on the, network, uh, on the network and the specific use case that we have. So this is our P4 DDoS detection pipeline. This is implemented in a P4 enabled SmartNIC, specifically Netronom. And what we do, we actually get a packet. We parse only TCP or UDP traffic. This can also be extended, but in this work, we consider that most of the attack vectors are related to TCP and UDP traffic. Then we check if this is packet is originating from or destined to a specific network of interest. And this is done with specific match action table. And we assign specific unique identifier. This actually defines the network, the network of interest in the data plane. Then we need to associate the packet with an epoch. So we get a specific timestamp from the P4 pipeline, and we need to calculate our flow values, flow counter values for a specific subnet or for the total flow counter uh, within an epoch. So if the packet falls in a specific in the in the current epoch, then we go to stage four. Otherwise, we initialize a new epoch, and we also initialize some counters. Then we move to stage four. In this stage, we actually identify new flows, and flow is a tuple of source IP destination IP source port destination port protocol. Uh, we increase the total flow counter if the flow is a new one. And then we evaluate our conditions. And if the, those values exceed predefined thresholds, then we use specific, a specific metadata header to carry the, that flag on the packet. Then we move to the packet sim analysis, this is stage five, in which we want to actually see the packet symmetry ratio related to the TCP packets and the UDP packets. And finally, we evaluate our third condition related to the packet symmetry ratio. If this exceeds a predefined threshold, then we consider that there is an anomaly. Finally, in the last, in the last stage, sorry, we collect the different values of the thresholds that we have seen, and we see if those values have exceeded our threshold. And if that is the case, then we create an appropriate P4 message, a P4 digest, in which we include the destination IP, the destination network, the protocol, the epoch, and we push that to an external controller that is going to apply specific countermeasures. So we have evaluated our approach, conducting both detection accuracy and performance experiments. 
we used a real network traffic, both for malicious and benign. The malicious traffic was related to a control experiment that was performed in, in SurfNet and in collaboration with Twente. And we used both Booter for dataset, a DNS a reflection amplification attack. And we employed also benign traffic from white backbone and internet exchange in Japan, if I recall correctly. We select the specific victim and we monitored 255 uh, networks. We injected both benign attack traffic and we considered four different attack scenarios, an underscaled one, the normal attack trace and overscaled one. And we evaluated the accuracy of our approach using, uh, <coughs> using this definition. So we considered two variants of our approach using two features, only flow-based features, and a three-feature case, which actually introduces also the packet symmetry. As we see, for both cases, we achieve very really good results, above 85% accuracy for the underscaled approach, and for the normal one overscaled, we achieve even, even, even more, even if I recall correctly, at 92%. Uh, which means that we actually can identify a really fast an attack, even in one second, that was the time window we employed, and even accurately. <clears throat> Finally, we conducted some kind of stress testing. We considered four different cases, a plain forwarding, a single feature case, a two feature case, and three feature case, and we want to test two different things, the measurement capacity for approach and the forward capacity. The measurement capacity is the capability for a mechanism to measure packets as we increase the packet rate. And the forward capacity is the capability of three of for those four different approaches to forward packets to their destination. So as it, is, as it is normal, what we see is that as we increase the packet rate, the measurement capacity is degraded. And this is not the case for the forwarding capacity, which for the plain forwarding, it can forward even all 5 million packets per second. But for uh, the DDoS detection mechanism that we introduced, we have a, a significant degradation. So what is the actual takeaways from these graphs? We see that increasing the packet rates actually doesn't let us to measure packets and we lose some kind of network visibility. And that reaches for 2 million packets per second for all of our mechanisms around 60%. So we can measure six out of 10 packets, but we consider that for a, for a 10 gig uh, interface and for 10 gig traffic, this could be sufficient. Another takeaway is that actually we can use P4 counters to get some measurements from the data plane, but these in these uh, cards cannot actually be used in the data plane. And this is some kind of problematic because we cannot come to a conclusion related to an attack using uh, measurements in the data plane. So in order to conclude, we have implemented the data detection pipeline before SmartNix. Uh, this provides a rapid attack detection. We can actually identify also the victim network. And this is really important as we want to, for example, to scrap the traffic to and a specific device to redirect the traffic, sorry, and scrap it in a different device. We have evaluated our accuracy within realistic attack conditions, and we have performed some experiments for high packet rates. What we want to also see is what the sampling impact on the detection accuracy and the performance, as we know from the literature and also from operational experience, sampling can give you a good a good view of your network and provide also results related to the acute uh, related to the existence of an attack and also we want to extend our scheme to not only identify an attack but also pinpoint the specific attack vector that was employed finally i don't mention that here but we have also made a lot of work in the mitigation part in which we are employing data plane schemes to offload to offload firewalling using specific signatures and not ip based uh, countermeasures so that was fast thank you and i'm glad to answer any kind of questions that you have thank you marinos also uh, thanks for um I try to be on time. Yeah, keeping the time yes yeah. uh, in, in principle we would have time for some questions now but uh, 
I suggest uh, to keep the procedure. And so people, if you have questions to the talks, please either write them into the chat and we'll take them up or write them down for yourselves. And uh, so that we can have a, a conversation after the talks. So um, with this, we're coming uh, to the next speaker. Um, that is Yatish Kumar from ESNet, who had to get up very early, unfortunately, before 5 a.m. We didn't manage to, uh, to cram all the speakers from uh, the Americas into the afternoon session, unfortunately. And Yatish will uh, talk about uh, high, precision, high precision telemetry in ESNet. Um, go ahead, Yatish. We see your slides, but we can't hear you. There, sorry. Yes, um, excellent. Um, right, okay. Um, so I've uh, talked a few times about uh, what we're doing with uh, high test telemetry. So I'll uh, gloss over that pretty quickly and uh, focus on just uh, one concept, which is uh, how do we reduce data given that we're uh, producing one to one telemetry? Um, but just to, uh, for orientation, I'll, I'll quickly explain what we're doing. Um, so the, the data flow for us um, is uh, that we're using our, the mirror service on our routers in order to uh, skim packets off for uh, telemetry, um, as opposed to, say, using optical taps. Um, uh, there are a few advantages to doing that. Uh, one is that we can apply ACLs in the router itself in order to control what goes into the, the telemetry uh, pipeline. Um, it allows us to statistically multiplex um, what, uh, how much traffic uh, we put in, um, but uh, also most importantly, uh, the router uh, trims the payloads. And, and so we might have say a terabit of uh, telemetry uh, flowing across the, or real packets flowing across the router, but only 10% of that is, uh, is headers, for example. Uh, so by uh, trimming the payload, uh, we get the most bang for our buck in terms of uh, the capacity of our, our telemetry platform. Um, the, um, the telemetry headers um, uh, from the router uh, go into an FPGA. Uh, the FPGA does real-time processing at a very high rate. Um, and then it returns um, uh, data in a few different formats, uh, which the router allows us to then route through a Mellanox card into a, a software backend. Um, this allows us to, uh, to load balance um, across the backend using the router itself. Um, and um, we can sort of mix and match the, uh, the number of FPGAs versus the number of collectors and so on quite easily. Um, so to give you a, a sense of scale and, and what's going on with data reduction, um, we basically have the ability to send many terabits uh, across our, our routers um, in ESNet 6. Um, those routers are sending 128 byte headers. Um, and so we end up with uh, very short packets uh, going into 200 gig ports on an FPGA card um, at very close to the maximum packet rate um, because we've taken the headers off. Um, and so the FPGA receives this sort of deluge of very fast, small packets. Um, the packets are actually the headers for many terabits worth of, uh, of traffic that we're monitoring. Uh, so it's not um, that uh, you know we're, we need a 100 gig port to monitor 100 gigs of, of cross traffic. Um, and they uh, basically implement fast data structures. Um, and so uh, I think there was a discussion about sketches, uh, there's other histograms, grids, time series, all kinds of data structures that you can use in order to, um, to sort of reduce the information from one-to-one -one, um, uh, time-oriented samples of every packet to, to something uh, slower. Um, the, uh, the, the fast data structures are then uh, sent across um, through the router uh, into a DPDK uh, backend. Um, it then um, connects up to Kafka. And uh, we've tested uh, 100 gigabits of, of traffic, but at much uh, reduced uh, packets per second uh, going through uh, sort of a DPDK to Kafka um, uh, complete uh, implementation. So it's possible to go a lot faster if you're just doing very simple things in DPDK or something. Uh, but if you actually want to run Kafka, then, uh, then it has to kind of uh, absorb quite a bit of, uh, of workload on the CPUs. 
And so we found between one and five million packets per second is, is reasonable to get from, from our testing. Um, so um, inside the FPGA, um, this is sort of the, uh, the architecture that uh, we're working towards. Um, you get your headers coming in from the left. Uh, these are 128 byte headers back to back um, and on more on two ethernet ingress ports. Um, and uh, the first thing we've implemented here is, uh, is a P4 programmable parser using the uh, Xilinx uh, P4 compiler. Um, and uh, this uh, basically um, makes sense out of the, uh, the raw octets uh, so that from, uh, from now on, uh, uh, downstream from the parser, um, all of the processing blocks that we implement uh, can uh, just refer to uh, sort of fields of interest. So if we're interested in, say, uh, the V4 headers, we know where they are. Uh, if you want to find VLANs, MPLS tags, whatever, uh, it's all available uh, in sort of a, a decomposed format. Um, and the first uh, extra thing that we do uh, using, the, using P4 again is uh, we have a TCAM uh, that can do five tuple matches. Um, that uh, TCAM, uh, five tuple plus VLAN uh, scope. Uh, and what we do is we assign a flow ID using that TCAM. Um, and so now uh, every packet has been tagged with a little piece of metadata, which is the unique flow ID for that particular flow based on the uh, setup in the TCAM. Uh, we use that flow ID in order to separate and sort all of our, uh, our uh, telemetry measurements uh, that happen further down. Um, the packet continues down in the P4 pipeline. Um, and now we basically have a whole bunch of um, uh, hardware blocks that are hanging off the P4 pipeline uh, that you get to hit in sequence and, uh, and configure and program as you need. Um, and basically, um, if you want to do histograms uh, or, or flow counters on, on particular things, uh, you grab the field that you're interested in, which has already been uh, sort of extracted by the parser. You always send in the flow ID, which is the, uh, the sorting index uh, for uh, the thing that you're trying to count. Um, and then you send the information, and then we just write uh, Verilog hardware uh, in order to do this at, uh, at full line rate. Uh, so this whole sort of uh, packet chain is, is running at 150 million packets per second, and the packets march uh, down, the, uh, down the chain one after another. Um, and the, what gets tapped and, and sent out is, is programmed using uh, P4. So it's uh, very quick to sort of configure, uh, reconfigure uh, things depending on, uh, on new ideas. Um, on the bottom, instead of statistics, uh, we can also send the, the traffic into a, a, a stateful uh, NPU um, to be you know, distinguished from a, a non-stateful NPU. Um, and uh, that thing can be microcode programmable, so we can uh, play around with headers. Uh, and we can keep track of state. We can look for you know packet to packet things. Uh, do simple decoding of uh, of um, of uh, multi packet flows and so on. Um, keep going, um, and eventually uh, we have uh, a lot of memory on the, on the FPGA, so um, we can uh, choose to implement large tables in, in DDR4, the 16 gigabytes of DDR4 um, on the card that we're using. Uh, and we have eight gigabytes of HBM uh, with a terabit per second of IO bandwidth. Um, and so we can go off and sort of implement very large scale uh, tables or, or whatever we want to do here. Um, and when we're done with all that, uh, the packet pops out uh, the other end of the P4 pipeline. Um, and uh, at this point, it's either um, uh, been converted into a telemetry packet, like uh, much like an IP fix packet, um, or uh, it uh, is um, a slightly different thing, uh, which I'll explain uh, a little bit later. Um, so if we do all this stuff and, uh, and say we're, uh, we're doing the one-to-one -one, um, uh, telemetry uh, measurement, uh, much like say I'd be fixed, uh, you get this sort of deluge of, of, uh, of information because there's one little purple dot for every packet that went through. And we started with a terabit of, uh, of traffic. So there's terabits of these, or at least um, terra counts of, of these packets going through. Um, 
And you can plot little sections of it and start to get some insight into the behavior of, uh, of uh, your flows. Um, so as a researcher, it's, it's good to first stare at this stuff and you know, try and see what, you know, even what's identifiable in terms of interesting features. Um, but I think many of these were already mentioned in the, uh, in the previous talk about uh, motivation for uh, why you want to do one-to-one. -one. Uh, telemetry, same, same sort of idea. Um, Trouble is that you can't record all this because that would amount to recording 10% of ESNAP. And, and uh, you know, even LHC guys uh, don't record things at that scale and it's kind of foolish to, to be doing that. So it's not feasible to record this, but at least we have it. Um, so then uh, um, this is something uh, that came out of staring at these things. Uh, Richard Siva um, he was, uh, was working on this and, and he noticed, oh, there's, there's patterns here. Um, and so in this case, he was looking at BVR traffic versus uh, cubic, and he started to notice that the shape of, of what's going on in these graphs is, is there's a clear signature. Um, so then as a human, you kind of figure out, okay, this, that's kind of cool. So, so now if I wanted to you know, distinguish between these things, I, I kind of know what I'm looking for, but it's still very brute force in terms of the amount of processing you'd have to do in order to continuously monitor something just to figure out that it's BVR. It's really a, you know, one fact, and once you know it, you don't want to keep, uh, keep sort of confirming that it's still BVR. <laughs> Um, so uh, one interesting thing that, that immediately pops out is that uh, if you're looking for, for this type of trend, uh, if you build a histogram, you can create bins along the vertical axis and just accumulate uh, all of these flows as they go in and, and do a count and just say which bin is this, uh, is this thing hitting and how much are we getting. And so you turn this sideways into, into a histogram, vertical histogram, and uh, you can still see the sort of signatures uh, in the bins of the histograms uh, for packet and for arrival times or whatever you're doing, uh, but it's totally not overwhelming because this is all the data there is in the histogram since, uh, since it's accumulating. Um, and so this same you know, concept applies with using sketches and uh, counters and you know, your favorite data structure. Uh, but this is uh, uh, point number one in terms of how do you reduce data from one to one. You still have benefits from doing one to one sampling in that you can actually calculate into arrival times for every packet, but you can, uh, you can just uh, accumulate them into, into these types of data structures. Um, then the other cool thing that, uh, that came out of that is that if I have these relatively slow moving data structures where every 10 seconds I can look at the histogram, uh, then you basically end up with, uh, with a feature matrix that you can use as a signature into machine learning. And so then you can uh, start uh, feeding this type of uh, formatted information into some machine learning thing. And in this case, it would look at it and say, oh, look, I see it's, it's BBR because I was trained to uh, look for that particular pattern. Um, the, um, as a sense of scale, uh, this pipeline that I, I described to you, uh, the blue stuff is the P4 pipeline, uh, which does all the sort of moving of the packets and tapping and, and whatnot. Uh, but the counters themselves are these little red things. Um, and so the, here we have 8,000 counters, um, uh, each is a sort of a per active flow counter. Um, and it's almost um, trivial in terms of how much uh, uh, area it's consuming in the total FPGA. Um, and so we can absolutely go nuts in terms of the number of counters and the size of histograms and number of histograms uh, because the total contribution to the, to the dye area is actually very, very small. Um, and so our approach will be to, uh, to fill this up with as many histograms as we could possibly dream of um, because it, it fits quite easily. Um, the uh, the extra memory is of course uh, on the side, so it doesn't count, and and the, so now we got eight gigabits of memory as well sitting for for scale. Um, so basically, um, when we uh, do data reduction, um, we can do this this histogram approach. Um, we can do single facts, um, and so if any two um, uh, source test pairs talk to each other. Uh, we have one little fact, which is these two, the addresses of the two um, entities. Um, those can uh, be put into some sort of connection matrix and you can you know, embellish it with, uh, with uh, a value, which is how frequently they talked or whatever. 
so this kind of structure is very useful for um, tracking, you know, security uh, events, DDoS events, that type of monitoring. Um, again, you can feed that into ML if you like. Um, uh, these are, are actually, we can pull these, these tables. Um, and so what we can do is we can send a, a polling packet uh, from our collector into the FPGA. The FPGA fills in a response into the, into the packet. And so the collector actually gets to decide how often it's polling uh, these uh, tables, whereas uh, while the tables themselves are being filled at, uh, at full line rate from the, from the massive uh, in Russia packets. Um, we can also do time series, uh, but with a slightly different mindset from just saying that we'll produce a time series output for every packet. Uh, instead, we can do, you know, moving uh, average rates, uh, average interarrival times, bad flows, etc. Um, so these are sort of the, the types of techniques we can do, and you can attach your favorite uh, sort of uh, parameter that you're interested in uh, to any one of these. Um, and uh, you have the full flexibility of, uh, of hardware uh, in order to, uh, to implement the arithmetic. So none of the limitations that come with, say, a barefoot, where you can only do certain kinds of arithmetic or, or certain amounts of it. Um, and of course, um, because uh, we're doing it uh, on the side of the router, um, no concern about messing up the, uh, the primary flows, uh, they remain uh, completely untouched uh, in terms of uh, going through the, the data. And uh, that's it. Thanks a lot, Yatish, uh, for presenting this uh, architecture and infrastructure uh, for high precision um, measurements. So uh, the last talk in the session is by Fabio Farina from GAR. And it's uh, moving a bit more to the consumption side from the um, data production side. It's called the yeah. path to modern logging, monitoring and alerting in GAR. Are you ready, Good morning, Fabio? Everybody. Let me share my slides. Can you see them? Yes. Fine. So I'm going to presentation mode. So here we are. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm Fabio Farin. I work uh, from GAR uh, since 2010. And my main goal in GAR is developing new services. And today I'm going to uh, tell you the path that GAR is uh, uh, following in adopting uh, telemetry uh, with an holistic approach. Uh, my presentation layout today will be very simple. I will go through uh, the history of telemetry in GAR, how it evolved, uh, and uh, the, the model we are currently uh, adopting and supporting, and of course, the future direction. Uh, the overall motto in GAR telemetry is this quote from uh, Lord Kelvin. And essentially, we, uh, we firmly believe that uh, if uh, uh, you do not measure something, uh, it's either broken or it does not exist at all. So we are quite radical in, in approaching the, the telemetry. Uh, GAR started uh, uh, a long time ago, of course, uh, with monitoring system. We started with Jeans, uh, our ad hoc developed uh, monitoring platform. And uh, the look and feel and the tools we, uh, we used uh, for building Jeans are the all the good uh, tools we already uh, talked about this morning. So we, we worked on weather maps, uh, uh, round robin databases, SNP counters, uh, NetFlow, and, and IP fix. Uh, later in early 2017, with the upgrade uh, of uh, a portion, a large portion of the backbone in Italy, we deployed the Juniper RPM on our routers, mainly for um, run trip time monitoring. Uh, collecting the data with the uh, influx database. This was our very first approach with uh, no relational databases. And we decided to deliver a, a custom kind of visualization for uh, RTT uh, data on, on the backbone. 
Uh, even later in 2018, we started a POC with uh, the commercial version of Elasticsearch, and we moved on the field of uh, uh, log analysis uh, because we decided to, uh, it's there that we decided to try uh, with an holistic approach to the telemetry and the logging uh, process. And the exercise itself uh, was more focused on learning and understanding the tools and trying to harmonize uh, as many different uh, information sources we, we had uh, in a single data lake and see how we, we can uh, harmonize uh, telemetry metrics uh, logging from application services, uh, from uh, infrastructure devices, both physical and virtual, and also from the, the traditional uh, ICT elements in the data center or, or in the uh, private cloud. Uh, after these experiences, we felt uh, uh, confident enough uh, to move to uh, production, and we decided to standardize the, uh, the monitoring tools and the processes uh, in order to have a coherent methodology uh, towards uh, these topics. Uh, in 2019, uh, we started by uh, centralizing uh, all the logs coming from the backbone routers and also from uh, a subset of CPEs. And uh, this year with the COVID crisis, we have seen uh, an explosion of new services. So we felt that uh, also having a telemetry model and, and a toolkit, a consolidated toolkit for the application service was, uh, was really needed. So, the second part of my presentation focuses on what happened in 2019 and 2020. Uh, let's start first from the uh, backbone logging facility. And the, uh, the facility is uh, very, very familiar, familiar, familiar sorry, uh, and uh, very similar to what we discussed the, today and what we have seen today today in, uh, in other presentations. Uh, we chose the Elasticsearch stack, uh, the uh, open source version, uh, paired together with Kafka queues uh, because we wanted to have the freedom to perform uh, streaming processing and having um, a queue for, for uh, facing eventual spikes from uh, the, the logging. And what we learned from uh, this, uh, uh, this setup uh, is that it's really, really easy to stop the, the platform. And I will go uh, a bit more in detail later in the presentation about how we set up uh, data lakes. But it, takes, uh, it can take a very long time to clean up the data. Because uh, uh, the very first data we sampled were uh, coming from very chatty devices. We had. Uh, uh, a high skew in the distribution of the messages pr produced by, by different routers. And we also noticed that uh, the, the configuration we had uh, on Junos was very noisy. And uh, we took uh, quite a long time uh, in cleaning up our data and understanding how to uh, fix uh, some logging issues. We, we also had to open uh, uh, Bugs uh, to to the Juniper support because uh, some of the of the repeated uh, logs uh, were indeed uh, due to bugs. And uh, what we received uh, uh, once the the uh, the platform was set up uh, is that the whole network uh, does not produce uh, an exceeding uh, an, an understandable uh, amount of data. I mean all the backbone produces about 60 megs uh, per day. And we are about uh, 80, between 80 and 90 thousand events per, per day. So uh, these are uh, quite reasonable rates. And the knock has been uh, introduced to the, to the tool and uh, it has been the knock itself that produced the visualizations and queries 
for their use cases. So uh, they use the for a number of um, of tasks, mainly uh, for identifying uh, misbehavior and, and faults and to interact better with the Juniper support because of course, having a single pane of glass helped the, the, the control over the, the network. And two, not two other notable cases are um, the uh, keeping track of uh, BGP uh, changes and uh, keeping an eye on uh, uh, access, access on uh, on the devices. Uh, as I said, uh, the the most recent change in uh, the uh, logging platform is that we started collecting uh, logs also from uh, Cisco CPEs. Uh, what about uh, the uh, the methodology that we developed uh, uh, about uh, the um, the data center world? Let me say. Uh, we, uh, we understood that a single tool is not enough for what we want to measure. So uh, we decided to separate uh, the stack uh, into underlay, uh, where we place uh, everything that's physical, interlay that uh, uh, where everything that's related to um, OS is uh, hypervisors, uh, Docker containers, Kubernetes stand, and overlay where the application uh, live. And we uh, sliced out the, um, the view through all the different layers uh, by using visualization as a holistic aggregation tool to uh, correlate uh, and have a unique uh, point of view from the, the different worlds. Uh, so, uh, by having different um, world, we also decided to use different tools because every layer has its own pros and cons, and we wanted to keep track uh, uh, of uh, uh, specific aspects uh, at a different uh, layer by using the the tool that uh, requires uh, uh, the smallest effort. Uh, uh, for, for that layer. So for, for example, we decided to use Zabbix in the underlay because, in the underlay because it is uh, very efficient in terms of notifications. And it also supports things that, uh, for example, Telegram uh, does not support very well natively, like monitoring the uh, room temperatures or the uh, electric fluctuation at the PDU's level. Uh, as I said, uh, at the interlay level for Docker hypervisors, we went for Influx and Telegraph. And uh, the uh, most variable ecosystem is uh, on the application level, where we decided to go with uh, both Bits uh, and, and Elastic for the logins and Prometheus uh, exporters for the uh, application specific application metrics and everything is then filtered and uh, visualized uh, uh, at Grafana. Uh, the key enabler for uh, this stack is of course automation. Uh, automation is applied both at the data lake level and for data lakes uh, we decided to, to adopt Kubernetes and develop uh, hand packages to deploy the, the data lakes and to maintain the data lakes and this minimizes the effort in delivering new platform and, and managing them, of course. And for the probing, uh, we using GAR, a combination of Ansible roles and Docker containers, and therefore it was natural to develop a, a subset of new roles, Ansible roles, that take care to uh, deploy the full stack of probes uh, needed uh, when uh, a new service uh, is kickstarted. So essentially, developers uh, and operators uh, do not need to perform any specific uh, uh, operation in order to activate uh, monitoring, logging, uh, and, uh, and alarming for, for new services because they come for free from our um, service 
activation chain. Uh, let me elaborate a bit uh, more on the advantages of having um, an holistic view. Uh, by aggregating different sources, we have been able to uh, give a different slices of the data. So, for example, uh, we call the, uh, the operation view uh, a vertical slice, a vertical perspective view, because looking at a single service, uh, we have been able to uh, integrate uh, both uh, uh, information coming from the uh, the underlay level, like for example, the, um, the network adoption in the case of uh, mirror services, but also correlate the, uh, the network information to level seven uh, logging information and uh, application information like uh, the uh, geographic location uh, from where the, the packages are, are downloaded. And this of course provides uh, a very uh, compact way to understand how a service is behaving. Uh, with the very same uh, information set, uh, we can provide more strategic views that are relevant to, to management, for example, adding an horizontal slicing, because by having a homogeneous level for different services, uh, we can correlate, for example, service popularity. So uh, in this example, I'm showing uh, new video One conferencing minute. services deployed for, yes, for the, the COVID crisis. And uh, so we, we can have a strategic perspective useful for, for planning. Uh, one uh, really key changer for the way uh, we, we are doing operation and monitoring is alerting. Uh, since the day we started adopting asynchronous alerting, uh, our approach to monitoring is radically changed because monitoring has become proactive. And by using a uh, very well-defined uh, threshold and triggers uh, using collaboration tools like, uh, like uh, Slack, sorry, uh, we have been able to reduce the uh, the amount of noise, and we have been able to focus the um, the alerting and notification to the domain expert. So, in general, as a team, uh, performing monitoring and analysis task has been come has become something uh, really really uh, lighter than than before. So, in conclusion, what we got so far is uh, we have a pretty satisfying uh, standard standardized telemetry approach. Uh, of course, uh, we really understood uh, that uh, the tools are not the important uh, part, but understanding what you need to uh, look at uh, is the key point. And the, the, the key point is to how to keep uh, the relevant data clean, as clean as possible. Uh, the next steps, for us are uh, trying to, to make the, the log analysis and the telemetry world converge. And of course, uh, we, uh, we want to focus uh, on, on a better way to analyze uh, on the telemetry level, also the, uh, the backbone traffic itself. So uh, we are also looking at uh, uh, GTI world and GRPC world uh, in order to add another layer to the uh, to the layers we already already have. Uh, one last point: uh, we uh, really believe that uh, uh, alerting is a key point uh, toward changing the all the, the overall way uh, with the operation because smart threshold and uh, richer notification are the key enablers for. Uh, reaching the site resilience engineering practice that it's um, that could be really helpful for for the way we operate services and, and network. Uh, that's all. I hope uh, I not on over time or at least not too not, much. Not too much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Fabio, and Thank uh, thanks to all the speakers. Um, we have some time for open discussion now. Um, 
There have been some questions already on the chat that were answered in the chat. So um, we don't need to repeat them here. There's a technical detail about a component in, the, in Alex's uh, talk. Shall we run the Menti then, um, Simon? And then yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead. Q&A so. after that. OK. OK, so, so um, let me just share my screen. We are planning to run a Mentimeter session, so please take your browser and uh, that will be a code that Tim will send. And then you use the menti.com with the code, which is just shown by Tim, 32364, and uh, I reply to these questions. Please, Tim. Yeah, so sure. If you on a mobile or your laptop or whatever you're on, go to menti.com put in that five digit code. And then this is sort of just a little easy opener. Just hopefully you all know where you're from. So we're, we're just interested to know whether you're coming from NRENs or perhaps campuses, perhaps you were a university network researcher. Maybe you've snuck in as a, as a vendor um, and seen me at, oh yeah, somebody has. Or maybe there's some other category you're from. Um, we're expecting most people here today to be from, from the NRINs. So I'll just give that a while, given there's 80 something people connected at the moment. Once we reach a reasonable number completed, they're just hitting about 50 now. I'll move on to the next question. I've got four questions for you, so it won't take too long. Okay, so that's good. We've got about 50 people. I suspect the uh, it's still creeping up. So I'll move on to the next question. So the next question is just asking you what um, sort of tools, protocols you're using today for network monitoring. So you can enter this as a um, free text question, or free text answer, I should say. Um, you can put in single words, sentences, or whatever, so, and it'll come up as a word cloud. Um, so the answers that come up more frequently will be bigger in the word cloud. So again, I'll just give it a little while just to see what comes in and see if there's any patterns from here. I suspect SNMP is going to be one of the uh, bigger ones, of course. Yeah, it certainly seems to be centering on NetFlow and SNMP, which is probably no surprise to anybody considering the tools we're using currently. Um, we'll um, share out the results of the Menti uh, on the event page later. So we're seeing quite a few of the things that were mentioned in the talks already coming up, things like Grafana, Telegraph, um, et cetera. Okay, so we've got a good good number of responses there now, up to 71. So everyone's playing along pretty much, which is good to see, 77 of 80 something. So I'll move on to the next question. The next question, just going to ask you, um, what are your main network monitoring challenges today? So you can answer as a one word or a short sentence, and you can repeat as many answers as you like, and it should just come up as, uh, scrolling boxes of text once people start putting things in there. So either from what you've heard today or perhaps just from what you know today, um, you know, what do you see as the challenges? So um, is it around big data as the first two answers here suggest? Um, is it more than that? So there are quite a few answers around analyzing large scale data, which is obviously a topic of today and something we'll hear more about after lunch with at least two of the talks. So again, I'll just give this a little while for people to put in what their concerns are, whatever it is that causes you to lose sleep overnight is your, for your network monitoring, if there is such a thing.
there's a few people mentioning multi-domain topics as well. Too many different tools is a good one. There's an, there are an awful lot of tools out there. Balancing business as usual with innovation. So always a challenge. And a few more of the data analysis responses coming in. So I'll just give this another 30 seconds or so just to see what else comes in. And then we'll move on to the last question. Bucks in Junos. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got a good number of responses in there over 60. So let's move on to just the last question. Um, so this is just going to ask you where you are uh, currently with deployment of a few things that we've heard about so far this morning, just to see what uh, your current status is. So your current status, and you can pick one of four answers, no plans, investigating, under deployment or already deployed for each of these with a little slider that you can move left and right. So multi-domain monitoring, service-oriented monitoring, streaming telemetry, in-band network telemetry or int, and applying analytics. So we're interested to see generally where people are on these particular areas. Um, so right over to the left means people don't have plans. Right over to the right means um, already deployed. And I so I don't know why it's showing specific answers for streaming telemetry and not the others. Uh, but it's giving us an idea anyway. So I think in particular int, as, as Mara explained, it's it's not really there wide scale in production yet. So it's it's not surprising that people are generally investigating that rather than deploying it. But it's quite interesting that you know these sliders aren't completely over to the right here for any of these topics. So these are definitely topics where the NRN's collaborating and discussing what they're doing and sharing experiences as we're doing today. It shows the value of what we're doing. I think that people are generally in the investigating or beginning deployment areas rather than the it's already deployed and out there. Um, although there are seven people here of the 48 that have replied that say they've already deployed streaming telemetry. So there's, there's certainly early adopters. Here. OK, I'll leave that just for another few seconds and then I'll hand back to Simon just for general Q&A for the last 15 minutes or so before lunch. So thank you very much for uh, taking part in that. As I said, we'll make a little PDF of the results available uh, at the end of the meeting. We'll have another little session like this um, in the final discussion slot. There'll be another four or five questions for you to give your feedback on. So thank you very much. Back to Simon. I'll stop sharing. Uh, thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks to everybody who participated. Um, it's great uh, to have such a, such a high level of engagement. Um, yeah, maybe the, uh, the first talks of the last sessions are already uh, like distant memory uh, for you. Um, but if you have uh, anything that uh, came to mind uh, that you were wondering about uh, during uh, any of the talks uh, we just heard, uh, that will be the opportunity to uh, to discuss that and I think everybody should be able to unmute themselves uh, please don't forget to re-mute yourself uh, when you're done um, to avoid embarrassments um, otherwise I would uh, I would start maybe with a question to Fabio um, your talk uh, was very easy to relate to for me because uh, you, you talked about a lot of um, you know, practical operational things that you uh, that you use these measurements for in the day-to-day -day work of a NOC. So it's uh, easy to relate to. Uh, what I was wondering about is um, how did, I, I assume that uh, there are different groups in SIGAR that are consuming these data. Like um, normally it's not the same people who operate like the, the mirror server and video conferencing servers and the network. Um, and uh, if you could um, talk a little bit about how these different uh, groups adopted the, this new unified monitoring system, because that's something I would 
Yeah. I'm wondering about the 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 NUC itself uh, is more focused on the on the logging tool. They are still not using the um, the Grafana dashboard though, because they, they need a, a deeper level of insight, of course. Uh, the uh, service operation groups uh, are benefiting uh, benefiting from the um, the knowledge sharing, uh, uh, mainly because of the, the overall approach we are following in GAR. I mean, we, we are going through uh, a process of knowledge sharing based uh, on, on Git and on GitHub. So essentially everybody is looking at the very same code base and the Grafana dashboard are also versioned in, in Git itself. And people is starting talking to each other uh, very frequently. So um, the, the Grafana dashboard is essentially unique for all the teams. So people have the chance to look at other teams' uh, uh, dashboards. And if there is something they like, uh, it's really uh, easy for them to, to adopt and, and opt in in, uh, in their group. Uh, moreover, uh, by using the, the horizontal approach, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, most of the group uh, are uh, reusing always the, the same base templates. So we are essentially standardizing uh, from a, a bottom up perspective rather than imposing something top down. And this is working quite well because people is, is engaged in learning new tools uh, and uh, and uh, adopting a uh, uh, nice, uh, cool uh, visualization for, for their data. Okay, so, so you develop your own dashboards or you, do you take them from the internet? Uh, both, both. Okay. Most, of, most of the dashboard uh, for, for the uh, lower layers uh, are developed uh, in, uh, in house. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, dashboard mainly coming from the, the Prometheus and application world are, are uh, fetched from the web okay. or, or from the, the application themselves that provide a, a ready to use dashboard and then we adapt them in order to harmonize the, the, the overall picture. Okay, I see, thanks. So anybody else who has a question or wants to share experience from how they adopt these technologies and their organizations? Just go ahead and unmute yourselves. What I propose then is that maybe we can start with three minutes uh, earlier, the, the lunch time, because so we can grab more food and have more things. I, I really want to thank all the speakers of this session. It was really very, very interesting from every point of view. And I think there is a lot of interest in collaborating and continuing to develop this environment for our NOx and production environment. So if, if there is no other question. Uh, and thanks. I think we so, can change. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, next session starts at 13.35 uh, Central European time. Um, so uh, see you back then and continue to use the chat. If something comes to mind, uh, then we, yeah. we'll queue this up for discussion later. Okay, thanks a lot. And thanks all speakers, especially uh, for the wonderful content and uh, enjoy your meal.